Hello, everyone. Peter Maravellis here on behalf of City Lights Booksellers and Publishers and the City Lights Foundation. I'd like to welcome you to yet another edition of City Lights Live, our virtual reading series that follows in the footsteps of our in-store calendar during the time of the pandemic, where we continue to feature the works of authors we know and love through readings, discussions, and forums moving into the summer season. As always, we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral grounds of the Ramatish Ohlone peoples, also known as the San Francisco Bay Area. I'd like to take this moment to acknowledge those who came before us as stewards of the land and to offer our respect. Tonight on City Lights Live, we celebrate the publication of an important new collection of writing titled, We Are the Middle of Forever, Indigenous Voices from Turtle Island on the Changing Earth. It's edited by Dar Jamal and Stan Rushworth, and it's published by The New Press in an innovative work of research and reportage. We are the middle of forever places, indigenous voices at the center of conversations about today's environmental crisis. The book draws on interviews with people from different North American indigenous cultures and communities from a range of generations and geographic locations who share their knowledge, experience, and wisdom in thinking about the ways we can maintain the best possible relationship to all of life on the planet. With us tonight are two editors of the book, Dara Jamal and Stan Rushworth, who will also be joined by several of the contributors, including Melissa K. Nelson, Shannon Rivers, and Kyle Powes White. Dar Jamal is the author of Beyond the Green Zone, Dispatches from an Unbedded and Journalist in Occupied Iraq, as well as The End of Ice, Bearing Witness and Finding Meaning in the Path of Climate Disruption. He has won the Martha Gellhorn Prize for Journalism and an Izzy Award. He makes his home in Washington State. Stan Rushworth is a teacher of Native American literature and the author of numerous books, which include Sam Woods, American Healing, Going to Water, The Journal of Beginning Rain, and Diaspora's Children. He makes his home in Northern California. Joining them will be Melissa K. Nelson. Ms. Nelson is a cultural ecologist and indigenous scholar activist. She is a professor of indigenous sustainability at Arizona State University, professor emerita of American Indian Studies at San Francisco State University, and board chair of the Cultural Conservancy. Ms. Nelson is an Anishinaabe Cree Medis Norwegian and an enrolled member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians. Also joining us tonight is Shannon Rivers. Shannon Rivers is a member of the Ekemel Aodam River People. Mr. Rivers has been a delegate and participant at the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues held at the United Nations. And in 2008 was selected as co-chair for the Global Indigenous Peoples Caucus, holding the seat for two consecutive years. He has conducted and hosted lectures on the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples at numerous local colleges in Arizona and California. He is a cultural ambassador for the Autumn Homac People Nation and for the four Autumn Nations located in Southern Arizona and Northern Mexico. Kyle Powers White will also be joining us. He is an indigenous philosopher and climate environmental justice scholar. He is a professor of environment and sustainability and George Willis Pack professor at the University of Michigan School for Environment and Sustainability. Professor White formerly served as the Timnick Chair in the Humanities in the Department of Philosophy at Michigan State University's College of Arts and Letters. To get the evening started, I would like to turn it over now to Dare Jamal and Stan Rusworth. Welcome to City Lights. And we decided to start, I'm going to just talk briefly about the origins of this book and then turn it over to Stan, who's going to speak briefly, and then we'll get into our speakers. So uh, around the time when I finished The End of Ice, uh, a pretty hard-hitting book about the climate crisis and how much trouble we're in uh, was when I met Stan. And Stan and I were uh, attending several of my speaking events together and watching the despair in the general population of the audiences, uh, both about the climate crisis as well as all the other crises that are converging now, and uh, realized that people really needed uh, a better way to kind of perceive and, and be amidst all of these crises. And, 
uh, Stan actually had the idea. It's like, well, you know, it might be pretty helpful to talk to Native folks because uh, we've been through all of this. And then we started talking about that idea. And uh, pretty shortly thereafter, it was like, hey, well, let's let's do a book. Let's let's get uh, think of a bunch of folks we can get together and just ask their take on on all of these crises and and basically kind of treat it like a an oral history uh, or a talking circle and and conduct the interviews in that way and then present them uh, in as authentic way as we could with uh, editing them very well but then also giving each person full agency and going over their chapters before it was going to be published so that's how this book uh came into being and over to you stan so uh, I, I like what you're saying, Shannon, about, about stories, about narratives. And these are either interviews, but they're really individual stories. And they're stories of, uh, to me, about each person that we spoke with is looking at the situation we're in today. Uh, one of my favorite scholars from back in the day, not too long ago, but Paula Donna Allen, uh, a Pueblo scholar, uh, talked about stories being an opportunity for the listener uh, to, to dip in and find themselves in that story at a time when crucial personal decisions needed to be made, uh, to, to be able to put themselves in that story. And that's how this uh, book has worked for me for the last two years uh, that we've been working on it. Uh, from uh, the interview with Kyle, which was an hour and a half long, pretty free ranging. And it took me three months to write that. So I was living in the middle of your story, Kyle, <laughs> for, for three months. And, and that had tendrils that went out to every aspect of my life in my teaching. So all of Kyle's work then and thoughts were going into all these different people's uh, minds and my classes. And what I found through this whole process was very much a, a calming, you know, a, a, a calming because we're living in a world now that, that fosters this illusion that we're alone and, and individuals and that we have to meet these crises uh, by ourselves. And, and certainly we do need to, as, as many of the uh, speakers in, in the collection talk about, we, we do have to meet these things on a deeply personal level, but we also have to realize that, that uh, you know, we are completely uh, connected in, in all of this. So what we do personally connects to everybody around us. So with this in mind, we felt it was really important to reach out to not simply experts in a field, but people uh, who, are, who are living with all of this. Uh, uh, the youngest person in the book uh, was 18, just turned 18 when we interviewed her. Uh, the oldest uh, is uh, in his 80s, you know? And, and just a broad spectrum of expertise. There, we have teachers, we have uh, ceremonial people, uh, there are academics, uh, there are people who are not academics whatsoever. Uh, there's a tremendous range. And what that, what that range does is, it, is, I think it gives a, a a set of tools, if I can use that word, emotional tools, because uh, certainly what we're meeting needs an emotional relationship, requires an emotional relationship to what's going on 
there's philosophical tools, there are uh, everyday tools about how to be in your garden, uh, there are relationship tools. Uh, one young woman, the 18 year old said, uh, the, the whole country needs to be in therapy. So they're dealing with grief, there's dealing with all of it. It's just a huge range of tools. And uh, I'm really happy with this collection. Uh, and we call it a collection, a gathering. And uh, you'll see on the cover, it's a basket done by Linda Yamani, who is a Rumson uh, basket artist uh, who has spent the last 30 plus years of her life bringing basketry back to her people. Uh, so it's a gathering. And uh, so far, it seems to be helping a lot of people. So that's our purpose. Uh, it's helped us. We hope it helps you. And uh, we expect it to. <laughs> so thank you very much for being here tonight because uh, uh, folks need readers, folks need, you know, events like this need listeners. And uh, thank you so much for being here. And with that, uh, Kyle, you have the floor. Bonjour, Bebom, come again on Deshnikas, Shishi Banek, Dubinda Grace, Bodwad, me and Dao. Hi, everybody. I'm Kyle. I'm an enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, and I live in our traditional territory. Uh, Potawatomi, we're a Anishinaabe people, and so our traditional territory is in the Great Lakes region. So I live in Michigan, where I work at the, the University of Michigan. And I think I met Stan you know, several years back, and I remember what struck me when I had the chance to, to meet Stan was the fact that our conversation gravitated immediately to just talking about the details and the dynamics of relationships, relationships we have with others we depend on, relationships with ancestors, relationships with people in different generations. And it was a conversation that I felt was timeless because it was just so focused on all these aspects of what it means to relate to others and to be focused on the quality of those relationships, not what those friendships or what those networks do for you to achieve a certain purpose, uh, but actually just what those relationships mean as a, a web of support, a web of support that makes us feel good about who we are. It makes us feel like we're on teams that are seeking to address crises, that are seeking to find solutions to the problems that affect us all, but oftentimes affect each one of us in, in, in different ways. And when I started asking around later, because, you know, I, 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 I'm i not from California, and I started asking around later, I was like, who is this Stan, <laughs> a person, the people that uh, uh, I, I, I know in the area, because I don't have a chance to talk to that many people in California. And I loved what came out. <laughs> um, I think you can tell a lot about somebody uh, based on how others uh, uh, talk about them in certain cases. And, you know, people shared stories about, you know, the fact that that Stan was trustworthy, that Stan was somebody that respected them, that showed generosity. It wasn't that, you know, oh, we know Stan because he got this award or <laughs> Stan won the lottery or <laughs> Stan, you know, published more articles than everybody. Uh, there were stories about trust. There were stories about generosity. There were stories about respect. And I think that's an important thing to focus on is, do we really tell stories about others? Are our stories ones that really find excitement in giving examples of people that show profound trust or show profound respect for someone else's consent, uh, like their free prior and informed consent or their self-determination, or stories about somebody that demonstrates a tremendous amount of accountability uh, or someone that demonstrates a tremendous amount of discretion when not being too curious about <laughs> something that they know are secrets that are important to other people or private information of other people. And so part of my journey has really been trying to uh, get to this place where my sustenance is based on 
the relationships that I maintain with other people, and I can focus on that uh, interdependency uh, with others. And so in the work that I do, I focused a lot on this issue of climate change. And part of the book, and I think one of the reasons why I'd encourage folks to really get into the book um, is, is it has a lot of different faces. And one of the faces is it's a book about climate change. But compare this book to any other book about climate change, and I think you'll get a sense of just how narrow and brainwashed we've been over the years in terms of just being told one way of thinking about climate change, one way of thinking about the climate crisis. And when Dar was speaking, and I think one of the, the great privileges of connecting with Stan was also to uh, connect with uh, Dar as well through this process and learn more about Dar's work. Uh, but Dar mentioned all the different topics that the book covers. And imagine entering into the topic of climate change or the face of climate change through topics that previously maybe you didn't think were related to climate change through a completely different pathway. What if instead of looking at models that show concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that serve to instill a certain type of fear about a future that none of us want? Imagine instead of entering into that route, you entered into climate change through gardening. <laughs> you entered into climate change through stories that native people have that were created prior to what we understand today to be the causes of human generated climate change, the industrial causes. And so this is just one face of the book. It depends on you. You can enter in through other faces, through other dimensions in the, of the book. But for me, as somebody that focuses on climate change, that's something that I'm always looking for how anything has to do with climate change. And in my journey, here's a couple of things that I learned. <laughs> Think about uh, what you understand uh, climate change to be. And when I remember early on in different parts of my education, that I was primarily taught that climate change was about physical phenomena that happen in the atmosphere. And if we're not too careful with how we relate to those physical phenomena, they could come back and harm us greatly or harm future generations. And so a lot of climate change was about science, it was about engineering, and it was sort of about uh, trying to make sure that the way that our lifestyles were oriented to chemical processes were ones that wouldn't, at the end of the day, have physical or economic harms that, that none of us want. But then in terms of people in my own community, so Nishinaabe community, uh, we never really talk about climate change in that way. In fact, I realized that ever since I was young, I'd always been talking about climate change. Uh, it just was never called climate change. It just seemingly didn't have anything to do with what I was reading in textbooks or what journalists were writing about or what scientists in the public sphere were saying about climate change. And I didn't really learn about climate change until I started to exercise my own memory and really thinking carefully about the fact that maybe what we understand climate change to be is less about your interpretation of science and more about the exercise of your memory. So for example, I began to remember the different Nishinaabe stories that I'd been told and realizing that each story that I could name, each story that I could cite, that I remembered some or part of it, or recently somebody had told it that was from our traditions as Nishinaabe people, these were stories that were not created in isolation. They were stories that all worked together. And they all worked together within a system of government that we had as Nishinaabe people that was not about, it was not based on what rights people have. It was not based on whether people had the means to gain wealth by one measure, like money. 
It was actually a system based on whether society over generations was organized in a way so that people could move and shift to the different seasonal changes that were happening throughout the year. And so the stories were all lessons about what it means in different parts of the year. All the stories occurred in particular seasons. And they were all lessons about how you ought to behave in relation to people, but also animals, plants, insects, others that you count on for your own sustenance. So they were all stories that were teachings about what it means to live in a way where you're very much attuned to the seasonal changes and how the seasonal changes relate to what you need to do with other people to take care of your society, to secure food, to secure medicines, to secure other things that you need from the environment. And so this was a ancient system where political philosophy, the way that society is supposed to work was always a matter of whether we were paying attention to our relations to seasonal change, but also keeping track in long-term trends, something like climate change. And so I began to exercise my memory even more. And I realized that in my college years, when I took the basic classes in political philosophy, in government, that they never talked about climate change. They talked about the Greeks and the Romans, but they never talked about any of these ancient people as having any type of science or philosophy about climate change. And as we know, those classes almost never talk about indigenous people. And I realized that already when we begin to come to the topic of climate change, starting with the climate crisis, that we often have never actually been exposed to climate change as a topic at any other previous point in our upbringing or education. Yet for Anishinaabe people, the situation is the opposite. Climate change is the oldest science. Understanding how we relate to the climate system is actually an ancient science. Physics is not an ancient science. Other sciences we think of as ancient are not necessarily the most ancient, but if we think about it, climate science would be the most ancient science. Yet today we think of climate science in a more mainstream way as a relatively new science. And so this got me thinking more about how we experience time. And I realized that oftentimes I feel compelled that whenever somebody says that there's a crisis, that they always have to say that it's something new. And the best way to enter into that topic is to figure out how we can create the means to adapt to something new. How do we create the solar power technologies or the wind power technologies to make up for all these years of industrialization that have put us in this position where we're facing grave risks to the environment that will have a huge, harmful, even violent impact on future generations? How do we find the ingenuity to do something about it? But what if instead of seeking newness, of seeking novelty, of getting excited about that which we have no prior reference point to, what if every time we encountered something that we didn't feel we had a reference point to, we instead said, wait a minute, I'm going to hold back on celebrating its newness and the thrill of its novelty. But instead, I'm going to keep asking questions about how what appears to me to be new cannot possibly be new. And what if instead I focused my energy on the idea that what appears to be new cannot possibly be so, and I won't presume anything is new until I've gotten to the bottom of why it can't possibly be true that anything is new. And in terms of the work that I do with climate change, this became a very important way of thinking because in journalism, in the media, in science, in academics, in all sorts of different high impact communications, people are concerned that not enough people in the world are acting aggressively or intensely enough to do something about climate change. And they're trying to motivate people to do better, to take personal and collective action to end 
this climate change crisis. But whenever I looked at these communications, I oftentimes saw native people being portrayed as people living on the brink, people who will be decimated by climate change impacts. So as to tell more privileged readers that this is a fate that could come to all humanity if something is not done quickly, that native people, their images as desperate people, uh, as people that were living on a thread, uh, they were living on a, the edge of a cliff, dismal stories. And in my own advocacy and organizing, I thought about my own community, and then I started talking everywhere to Native people from different communities about what they actually thought about climate change. And the more people I talked to, the more common threads occurred, and that it wasn't about living on the brink, but say, for example, speaking from my community, so Potawatomi people or Anishinaabe people, the reason why we're in the climate change crisis in the first place, <laughs> Uh, the reason why we're in this crisis in the first place is because the United States, and in other parts of the world, you can say the same for other countries, but the United States dispossessed us of our land. They did so rapidly and violently, which is why the industrial sector that burns fossil fuels took root quick enough to create these massive impacts in the atmosphere before science caught up to it. And so we were the first people harmed by that, but we were harmed not just because we were overwhelmed by these industries, but because the United States did not respect our consent. They did not respect our self-determination. They did not act in trustworthy ways. They did not engage in accountable behavior in relation to us. The United States had no interest in these relationships. And another way of saying this is the United States had no relationship in kinship. And you fast forward many generations later, and you'll see some of this in the different conversations in the book, but indigenous people, we have solutions to climate change. We have many solutions, but in every single case, what stops us from implementing the solutions? Well, our land bases aren't big enough. We don't have the capacity to have our own educational institutions. We're still struggling with a US bureaucratic system that hates us and doesn't want resources to be adequately provided in ways that we can exercise our self-determination to show just how much can be done when our own ingenuity is leading in a response to climate change. And so our situation is not one of living on the brink, but actually one of encountering the same old problems with living under conditions of colonialism. And so for us, climate change is something that's not only experienced as something that appears to be new, but something that resuscitates the same problems that American people have failed to address in the past and that our ancestors told them they needed to address at the time. And every subsequent generation told the United States that they needed to address it. And so what type of education do we need then to get people to understand what actions to take to address climate change, well, we need education that shows that if you end colonialism, if you end racism, then you're actually ending the practices that are among the most powerful forces in the world, stopping everybody who wants to mitigate climate change from doing so. The fight to end colonialism, the fight to end racism is climate justice. And when we get caught up in these presumptions of newness and novelty, we get caught up in these struggles toward finding technological solutions. But today, all of those technological solutions from solar power to forest conservation, they're harming indigenous people everywhere, again, as if people never remembered what their own ancestors had violently done in the past. And so there again is an example of what I started with of memory, that actually climate justice is about memory. Climate change is about an exercise of our memory in a lot of different ways. And it's been great to be part of this book project as an action of memory making 
and I want to thank Stan and Dar for uh, taking me along that that journey and that process of uh, of memory making and dialogue and conversation. I look forward to further engagement uh, uh, tonight with you all. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Kyle. Your contribution to the book is invaluable. Um, I want to pause for a minute and check. Melissa wasn't yet here when we started, and I wanted to check in with Peter in case she uh, had. No, she hasn't popped in just yet. So okay. we're still waiting on her. Yeah, sorry okay. to say. No problem. We will, we will then move over to Shannon. And uh, Shannon, uh, we're going to have a little bit of a dialogue here and uh, uh, Stan uh, came up with some questions and I have some of my own, but uh, to, to get the ball rolling, Shannon, um, we, we thought it'd be good if you started just talking about um, the river that was dammed on your people's land, uh, because your chapter is essentially about ba the balance and imbalance that we're in now and then trying to come back to balance. And so uh, can you talk about the damming of the river on your people's land and, and start out with that and, and give it history uh, for everybody on that and its impact? Well, thank you very much, Dar. I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, one of the things that um, I think what you know, kind of going back to what uh, our brother Kyle was saying is that we get kind of pigeonholed into these conversations, right? Um, for for me as a as an Oatham, uh, remember the they the U.S. government and the Spanish they called us Pima Indians, uh, and we lived directly off the Gila River, which is runs uh, a river that ran directly through, almost in the center of what they now call Arizona. Um, it was one of the largest contributory rivers that starts from New Mexico all the way down uh, and it used to run to the Colorado River. Uh, during the 1870s and all the way up to 1910, uh, water was diverted uh, from the Gila River in towns like Coolidge and Florence and uh, for first Mexican settlers uh, and then for the white settlers that would come in later after the 1950s and, or 1850s and 60s. And so what happened eventually then, uh, the Oatham, the, the Pima Indians, I don't really like that term, but, but because of uh, uh, the audience, I wanna make sure that you understand who we're talking about. We are the Akamir Oatham, that means the river people. Uh, the Pima uh, are my people, but but when we met the Spanish, we said Pashi and Maj in my language or Pasha Maj means uh, we don't understand you. Uh, then they called us Pimas. I don't know how it derived into that, but, um, and I got to go back into the annuals to, to figure that out. But so what, hap what eventually happened is uh, they started damming up our river. Uh, we started losing, uh, uh, not only our river, but our lives. And in fact, the Chicago Tribune wrote a, an article in, I believe, in 1901 or 1910 uh, of thousands of thousands of uh, uh, Pima Indians dying of starvation. Um, and remember, you're in the Sonoran Desert uh, and you get probably 10 inches of rain uh, there, uh, depending. It's a as a mass, a massive body of a land, a, a body of land, but it has some this great diversity, right? Of uh, its ecosystems of uh, two hundred and something, uh, a numerous of bird species and plants and animals that roam that territory. Uh, but once you take away that river, uh, not only does the ecosystem die, the the people start to die, and the reliance of that river. Uh, for our people started to uh, really culminate into uh, what do we do next? Um, but so the river uh, being the lifeblood, and I would imagine I, going back to Kyle's people up, up in the north, they have more water than we do. Um, and so for us in the desert, uh, our livelihoods depended on that river. 
And, um, and what you see then is a culmination of, and I'll get into that, kind of the historical impacts, ecological, social, economic, spiritual, and cultural impacts uh, that took place over uh, the last 150 years or so. And, and so continuing on with that, uh, when people are forced to leave because of what was done to the river, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, that was one of the things that struck me of, of starting to work on this, this book and talking to you and others, that there's this indominant culture, there's this panic of, oh, we're in this crisis, how are we going to get through this? Well, your people have already been through seriously abrupt climate change. Right. Uh, so can you talk about that historically, like what happened to the diaspora? How, you know, wh what happened personally and then how did people adapt and what were the effects? So I believe um, back in uh, 1870 or so, uh, they said, you know, you know, you, uh, you uh, Pima Indians are having a hard time. Why don't we move you to a place like Oklahoma? Uh, in fact, they uh, sent some of our leadership to Oklahoma and the Oklahoma, they came back and said, what are you crazy? We don't want to move to Oklahoma and then not to, not to diss Oklahoma, but uh, we were so used to our environment, our place, our land. I think you have to recognize that, that, that indigenous peoples are, are intrinsically tied to the land, spiritually, culturally, ceremonially. Um, so our leadership said no. And you, and you got to imagine what they faced. I can't imagine. Uh, you have thousands and thousands of autumn people dying because of the lack of water, because of the lack of resources. And so their, their livelihoods have changed dramatically or was changing. And they had the vision to say, you know what, we're going to stay here and we're going to make it work. And so they, they started pumping well water. They started, and you remember, it, you, could, you could probably go 20 or 30 feet down and get some water, but uh, because of the soil and because of that system there uh, was so not only uh, difficult to, to grow and to plant, uh, but, but for us as Oatham people, we decided to stay. Our leadership decided to stay. And thus you have the Gila River uh, Indian community or the reservation there today. And so that's, that's a story of, of, you know, one example of how your people got through this and and so expanding out to people who did have to leave and didn't have a choice to stay um what uh you know can you comment some on on um what is it going to take for people to kind of refine a balance who've who are forced to leave maybe talk about it in the historical context of indigenous people who are forced off their lands and then, and then, and then, currently, what's it going to take for broader society, society now to start coming back in and find something like balance? So, as as most of your audience, if they got the book, my discussion uh, is is particularly about balance, or we call it uh, pivusic vusic, coming uh, into this balance, to this unbalanced, to this balance, right? Uh, for us as Native people uh, that decided to stay, the autumn that decided to stay, many, uh, remember, we, we also got to go back to 1940s and 50s of the, the Relocation Act, where they wanted to, to kick, uh, to send Native people out uh, to a large metropolitan areas like New York or Chicago. For us, it was Chicago, LA, San Francisco. Um, but, but, but many stayed, right? And many um, wanted to uh, do their best to create a life there. Uh, for us as, as, as Autumn, uh, you gotta imagine, uh, they were faced with so much difficulty. We, I believe, and I'm not sure about this, but, but I know that we were the, one of the first nations, remember, in the 1950s or the eight, I keep saying 1950s, I don't know why, but um, in the 1850s and 1840s, the Gaston, uh, Gaston Purchase and the Treaty of Gu Guadalupe Hidalgo started to, to form and to take place. The US settlers or gold rush folks started to move through our territory. 
uh, we were then selling them Durham wheat. And we were one of the richest tribes in, uh, in what is now called Arizona or in the Southwest. So we made a lot of money, we were doing very well, but that didn't last very long. Uh, I would guess maybe 10 years. Uh, so if you can imagine a tribe that was doing very well and, and uh, creating this economy, um, uh, and then going from with le within 100 years, less than 100 years, 50 years to desperately needing commodity foods, desperately needing water, and going to the 1940s where relocation happened because poverty and inequality and uh, extreme poverty was, poverty was hitting our reservations. But then in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, you see this thing, this increase starting to happen or this new disease happening, which was diabetes in, in our reservations, the 60s and 70s. We had no clue what that was, but because of our our, our intake of Western, this Western diet or this commodity foods. You're talking lard and oils and things that we weren't, we weren't uh, used to. Uh, um, our bodies begin to break down emotionally and psychologically and spiritually, right? And so uh, you have this people that tried to their best to maintain this balance and to live in the community and to stay on the reservation. Um, our reservation is about 620 square miles. If you can imagine, um, if we used to have all of uh, what is pretty much Southern Arizona uh, and into Mexico. So the balance itself um, is maintained through our culture and our traditions. But, but I, when I think about my grandparents, my great grandparents and what they went through and, and through that difficult time, uh, my great grandmother was born, I believe, in, in 1898, and so she saw the death of a lot of autumn uh, by the time she was 10 or 11, um, by 1910. Um, at that time, so uh, I don't know how they did it. I mean, you know, because I just can't imagine. One of the things that you do, Shannon that really struck me is that you bring traditional sweat lodge into maximum security prisons. And, you know, it strikes me listening to you tonight as, as it did writing up your chapter was how that's somehow analogous to uh, kind of the idea of this book being some medicine to a dominant culture that's kind of trapped in its ways, if you will, and, and can't find a way out by by yeah, any of the kind of business as usual tools sure i mean is it possible to talk a little bit about you know how you see this this kind of impasse that dominant culture is in and needing the wisdom and and what you and others in the book are talking about just like the folks in the prisons are so so desperate for what you're bringing in in sweat lodge Right, so uh, depending on where I'm at, but uh, most prisons I work in uh, are level three or level four, and that means that they're maximum security units. Um, there are some prisons that I go to that are level two. Um, I just returned from Arizona uh, from Saguaro uh, facility, which is an Eloy in the middle of, it's an all them land on our territory. Uh, but in that prison alone in Saguaro, they house 1,800 men uh, and 1,200 or, yeah, 1,200 of them, 1,400 of them are Hawaiian uh, uh, citizens. And then I have uh, 400 uh, uh, others that come from, you know, uh, Tennessee and, and Texas and uh, central part of the country. And then I have a big population of Native American men that, that come from there, Ohio, the places like that. So bringing that balance into a facility, uh, I was the um, head chaplain or spiritual leader, Native American spiritual leader at, at uh, Salinas Valley, uh, which is one of the, uh, there's 33 prisons in uh, the state of California. Uh, which, is, which is interesting is that I'm in California, I'm in Long Beach right now, I'm at my home, but 
if you look at Long Beach, uh, or if you look at the state of California, all the mission systems are aligned with where most of the prison systems are located today. And so uh, as chaplain or as Native American spiritual leader, and I say chaplain because that's what they call us on paper, right? They called us that for quite a long time. Uh, now they change it to Native American spiritual leader, but, uh, but bringing that balance into such hard places like that. And as, as, you, as I was uh, going through my book, in fact, I, I kind of don't, you know, for me, I don't know about you guys here, but, you know, you read about yourself and you and you see yourself on video, you kind of like, ah, you know, I don't like seeing that or hearing that, uh, I'm, you know, it's kind of my thing. But 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 going into the prisons, um, I remember the men themselves uh, are very closed off. Right. And they 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 sit there with their arms crossed. And these are big fellas. I'm a big guy, too. I'm about six two, but these guys are pretty big. I mean, they got some big shoulders and a bunch of muscles, and they they scare me sometimes, right? But bringing this balance, this the ceremonial balance, the the desperation that you mentioned, Dar, is that these men want acknowledgement of who they are. They want spiritual connection. They want song. They want love and compassion, right? They desire that because, unfortunately, many of them never had that. Uh, I had a gentleman who was a Chickasaw gentleman um, who was incarcerated, you know, since he was 15, basically. And uh, he'd had a, a, a life sentence of, I think, 75 years and um, a long time. Right. And and he just recently got out on a retrial on something that we see in California happening, uh, not as often as it should, but 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 should happen more and more should happen more and more i and i just saw him recently and i did a sweat with him on the outside right and he has to wear this beeper on his leg this this monitor uh, on his foot and we call him beeper now as as that's his new indian name we tease him but um but he's my nephew right he's he's probably a little older than me but he's my nephew he's learning ceremony he's learning a song and he's he's the balance that you you could see the light in his eyes come back the 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 power of the ceremony the power of our culture the power of our language the power of our songs those are the things that create this balance and our men and women because i don't just go into the men facility i go into women facilities where i see that these men and these women have been lost for so long they have been they've been struggling for so long. Uh, the economic situations on reservations is dire. The educational systems of what you see, Native Ways to College in my background is a you is a young program. I started here in LA and, and I'm director of the program. Um, and it, my job is to find Native American students and bring them culturally relevant services, educational programs to them. And if these young folks has had if these folks in prisons had something like that, if they had mentorships, that leadership, appropriate leadership, then we would not go there. We wouldn't be joining the gangs like, you know, the, some of the gangs that I talk about in my, in my, in my, in my chapter, that, that this balance for them. Uh, and, and I could just bring in a stick of sage, or I could bring in the drum and I could sing a song and offer a song and you could feel that tension leaving their body. You could, you, when we stand around the fire and it, some of these maximum facilities uh, that I go into, you don't get much wood, <laughs> right? And so we're like struggling to keep the fire going and they're getting the rocks hot. And, and but it doesn't matter to them. They wanna be by a fire. They wanna be, hear the song. They wanna, they wanna see me and talk to me and, and, and touch me and hug me and feel me. You know, the guards say, hey, Mr. Rivers, Chaplain Rivers, you can't do that. I'm like, you know what? These are my nephews. I trust them. I love them. They're like, well, your life could be in danger. I'm like, my life's been, been in danger since your people have come here, man. You know, I, I, you know, let's be real. You know, I grew up on a reservation that is hard, that is unbalanced, that struggled. But my people, our people, indigenous people are beautiful people. We are the moral compass. And I mentioned that in the, in the book. We are the moral compass. We are the we are the environmentalists before environmentalists. Environmentalism was was popular. 
before Jane Fonda or, or Cher or anybody wanted to be an Indian, right? Before Standing Rock, before Wounded Knee, before all of that, we were folks that protected the land. You see that all over. And in Los Angeles, I'll just say this dark because I've been rambling, but in Los Angeles, we have the summit of the Americas happening right now. And you got all these leaders coming in, quote unquote leaders. I don't know if they're going to talk and buy the environment. To me, they're talking about how can they continue their destructive ways of life that are not sustainable. And you and I are at, are, are at odds of that. I would imagine that the majority of the audience are environmentalists or want to help in some way. We got to, we got to and I'm not big on the political system. I, I struggle with that. But, but we have to vote people in that are really truly going to make the change and to, to, to look seven generations down the, down the road. And, and, and we don't do that enough. We don't have these conversations like Kyle was saying. We don't, we don't you know, let's talk to indigenous peoples. Let's talk to those that are still. My, gra my mom did not graduate high school, but she has a PhD on reservation life and survival. I got a master's from UCLA and that's cool and all, but my brothers and sisters tease me. They're like, nah, whatever, you know, let's talk about simple things in life and how to live and how to look forward to seven generations. So sorry, Dari went off, but. Absolutely perfect. Thanks so much, Shannon. In a perfect way to end, pause for just a second. And thank you again for your invaluable contribution to the book, Shannon. And I've, I've seen that Melissa fortunately has joined us. So I will turn it over to Stan and Melissa. Melissa, where are you? Hello, hello. Greetings, everyone. Good evening. So sorry to be uh, late to this special presentation with my brother Kyle and Shannon. So good to hear your words and your medicine and your stories and really good to see you again, Stan and Dar. Uh, I love this book. We are in the middle of forever and I love um, the message of the evolution of change and being in harmony and working with the changing earth because we know the earth is always changing and we as humans are always changing. So I'm very grateful to be here and um, really excited to be part of this book. Uh, again, my apologies for missing you, especially Brother Kyle. Um, no disrespect. Um, couple of things. Change always happens, right? Couldn't quite be here at the, the time allowed. But I want to share just a little bit about, you know, my chapter on dispelling delusion with alchemy and really looking at, I think, one of the central questions that the book looks at, and that is, how did we get to the state of imbalance? And Shannon, you were talking about that rebalance that is so necessary for um, folks who have been incarcerated. And so how did we get to such an imbalanced state and trying to trace some of that historically and philosophically and, and in our own lives, um, how we live every day? What can we do to dispel this delusion that colonialism has implanted uh, in so many of our minds, um, almost like uh, a disease. Um, and I talk about in the chapter uh, with Stan and Dar, uh, the concept of Wendigo or Wetiko. I don't know if you spoke to it, Kyle, um, from our Anishinaabe Confederacy and many of the Northeastern tribes, part of our oral tradition talks about this cannibal spirit and Winona LaDuke has been speaking about this in terms of uh, Wendigo capitalism uh, with the pipelines and the extractivism. And uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer has spoken about it as well and written about it in terms of the insatiable uh, hunger and uh, consumerism um, that has infected a lot of us in um, especially the US and the developed countries. 
Um, so in this chapter, um, Stan, who has also been deeply influenced by the work of one of our late teachers, um, Jack D. Forbes, uh, Lenape scholar and one of the founders of the Native American Studies departments at UC Davis. Um, he wrote quite a bit about this in his book, Columbus and Other Cannibals. Um, during the quincentennial. And I think that that concept is even more relevant today in terms of, you know, he didn't even have social media um, at that point, right? And today, um, what we see happening with social media and genetic engineering and kind of the cyborg relationship between technology and biology, um, we see that this spirit of extractivism and um, being out of balance with natural law has really reached a state that is quite disturbing, quite disturbing. Uh, and yet, um, as I know Kyle's chapter refers to and many, indigenous peoples have been through so many apocalypses before through these 500 years of colonialism. Um, that we have built up um, these, these tools and these strategies and these resilient systems for really adapting to extreme change suddenly. Um, and I see that we shield ourselves or we're able to be uh, protective and have an immune system to some of this through our original instructions and our kinship networks and our uh, principles and ethical frameworks uh, that keep us, you know, hopefully more balanced and wanting to create systems to engender more balance with our economies. So I'm very hopeful by a lot of things that are happening in the land back movement, in the indigenous food and farming and food sovereignty movements, in the environmental justice movement in the indigenous rights work that Shannon and others are deeply engaged in at the international level. So despite this ongoing um, dilemma of the Wendigo consumerism um, taking hold around the earth, there is a counter movement, um, almost like a parallel track happening with so much uh, incredibly positive and regenerative work happening in these small islands and pockets of indigenous regeneration. And that's also growing in terms of alliances with um, Black and Latinx and other um, communities of color who've also suffered from such um, brutal histories and atrocities. So, there is this really cooperative um, alliance of solidarity uh, building at these small levels, at the local, at the regional, at the intertribal level. I think one excellent example of that is the Buffalo Treaty that's been happening with First Nations and Native American tribes uh, across the US Canadian border. Um, led in large part by the Blackfoot Confederacy to bring back the buffalo across the land and to decolonize that political boundary and to link up again those indigenous habitats and landscapes so that the buffalo can have freedom to um, travel and roam in those traditional territories. So even though I, I see great despair in our communities and throughout the world today, um, which the book also doesn't shy away from talking about, uh, I also see great opportunities for solidarity and alliances and building new kinships. Uh, as uh, Kyle speaks about so much, how do we renew those kinships and those treaties with creation again? And so I do some of this work through the Cultural Conservancy, a indigenous led nonprofit, where we manage two local indigenous organic farms in Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo territory. And this, just the sense of, um, the sense of joy and hope and liberation and uh, community uh, that happens at those community levels um, keeps me going, keeps me very inspired. 
So I just wanted to share some of that. I don't know how much time we have, Dar and Stan. I don't know, do we have to the, another 20 minutes or so? I think all together, uh, we're gonna finish around 7.30 or something like that. Yeah. We've, got okay. a little, we've got a little bit of yeah, time. Yeah, good, good. I just wanted to make sure but I wasn't going over. We can um, go over a bit, it's yeah. not, not- No, great. no, I don't, I don't wanna do that at all, yeah. Can I ask you a question? She please. <laughs> well, one of the things that really struck me here, and you know, the part that Dar uh, took out of your interview, uh, you say, no fear, open eyes, open heart. This whole country is carrying this collective grief, and it's about letting that grief be felt. And you go on to talk about this as a soul wound. And then you say, and until that soul wound is addressed, frankly, honestly, and openly with studying genocide and the truth of what happened here, it's going to be a trauma that is going to twist up our hearts and minds. Only in the sunlight of understanding can this wound begin to heal. And I, I wanted to ask you to, because a little later you talk about it, the local applications of studying genocide. And this is something that I see in, in uh, my classes, when people really can see over a long period of time what that Wendigo or Wetiko uh, uh, spirit creates in, in the school system, say, by the silence around genocide. So, you know, we can't really look at it. So we can't really have genocide studies, okay? but we should have, and what comes out of that on a local level? I mean, I don't wanna put words in your mouth, but you kind of ignited the thought for me because I see students coming out the other side of that, not all wrapped up in guilt and shame, but, but glowing in awareness and feeling that, that that brings them, that empowers them to see how we've gotten here. Okay, so it kind of ties into what we were talking about earlier about time. So could you yes. rip on that? Uh, absolutely, Stan. No, thank you for bringing that up. And um, I agree that genocide studies needs to happen at you know local levels. I mean, at many different scales, but it starts with where we live because um, unless you are born and raised and your ancestors are, you know, creating the soil of the land for generations and generations, truly indigenous peoples of that area, we are settlers on someone else's land and we need to understand uh, what happened to displace the original peoples. So I'll use California as a case study where I was born and raised as a mixed race native woman settler on Sinkion, Paiute, pardon me, Sinkion, um, Pomo, uh, U, um, Yuki uh, lands and now Coast Miwok and Ohlone lands. And so I wanted to learn about the genocide that happened on these lands that I stand on. And so the mission system that Shannon referred to, those 21 California missions, I used to bring students to these missions also in um, American Indian Studies classes at SF State. And um, of course, I didn't require native students to because it was so traumatizing or re-traumatizing for native California Indian students, but many of them wanted to go and narrate and tell the stories from their family histories um, and memories of those places. And once students or anybody really hears about what these missions, California Spanish missions were to the native people, they absolutely, it dispels delusion. It dispels the delusion and it, it breaks apart this idea um, of that colonial encounter being either a benign one or it may be not so bad or it brought positive things. The lie that was told to fourth graders in California curriculum up to just a couple of years ago until that curriculum is finally being altered and revised by native California Indian educators like Greg Castro and others who are also in the book. So um, learning about the genocide um, that happened there and having guest speakers like L. Frank Manriquez, who is a California Indian 
um, scholar, artist, cartoonist who um, does artwork around the impacts of the mission system. So not only learning about it in a cognitive, you know, logical way with the population decline and the treatment, that's important, but also seeing artwork being done to kind of open up the emotional and imaginative realms to really feel what happened and the impact it had on its descendants. So um, I think that genocide studies are, are critically important and, and those stories need to come out. I think we now see finally, thanks to the children showing up from the boarding school cemeteries, um, and I want to acknowledge the Southern Paiute and their Salt Song Trail project that 25 years ago was trying to raise awareness about all of the children who died in the boarding schools and were buried in unmarked graves um, at these boarding schools. And it was really those 215 children who showed up last summer up in BC, Canada that revealed, you know, Finally, the world was ready to hear it. Native people kind of always knew this, but the mainstream media was finally recognizing the genocide that happened in the residential schools in Canada. And then with our first, you know, Secretary of the Interior being an indigenous woman, Deb Holland, she required, you know, a report and investigation into the boarding schools uh, in the United States for the first time on an official government level that also has been revealing the profound level of abuses and um, violations and the number of children who, who died there. Uh, so these are hard histories. They're very painful. They're in our family. My mom went to boarding school. My grandparents went to boarding schools. Um, many of us have been touched by that. If you're native California Indian, your ancestors were incarcerated in California missions. So those stories are coming out and it's really like puncturing a you know, a, a festering wound so that it can um, heal um, because when it's, when there's the silence of it, pretending it didn't happen, um, and those people suffered uh, in silence um, and we can now have rites of passage and, and proper shifts and ceremonies in, in consciousness so that those children's spirits and all of those can be freed because the truth is finally out and um, we can move forward in a much better way. Thank you. I, the other thing, when we did the interview, you started talking about the river mm. and uh, it, it, it brought us all into a, a beautiful, a beautiful place. And uh, it just kind of strikes me that puncturing that wound and, you know, getting us out of the delusion allows us to feel when we put this application to what people call climate science, then it allows us to feel and see the world around us rather than being caught in uh, a space that disallows that connection. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. absolutely yes they're they're related i mean whenever that kind of healing can happen for releasing trauma um it it opens up so many other awarenesses and perceptions and feelings right and that's what so many of indigenous ceremonies are there for that kind of renewal and transformation and they happen in our places, with our places, so we can truly hear the sound of the river, and we can truly see the, the beauty of the, the water and, and feel the medicine of the water. So many water protectors are trying to remind everybody about the medicine of water and how incredibly um, fragile in a way our freshwater is in the world today. We're in one of the most severe droughts ever in California and in the West. And that's how climate disruption and global weirding is showing up by, you know, flooding in some places, drought in other places, 
erosion, so many ice sheets melting. It's really a lot about water and the changing water systems. So um, going back to our fresh water sources um, to make offerings and, and give songs and we lay down tobacco and to listen to the rivers and what they're telling us and what the springs are saying to us and go and clear the springs um, so that that fresh water can keep coming is, is so important to all of our health, but especially as indigenous peoples, we come from water keeper traditions and some exciting things are happening with the Klamath dams coming down in Northern California and Oregon. That is such a fantastic change to um, bring back the salmon and restore the well-being of that river as well as um, even the eel river the river i grew up on there's now a proposal to take down a major dam that has been um, very severely impacting the health of that river so i see that as a decolonial process of really um, taking those dams, those dam dams down and um, bringing back the health of our ecosystems and our watersheds. And I wanna do a shout out too, to Chief Kelleen Sisk of the Winnemum Wintu people who have been actively trying to protect and restore their sacred sites along the McLeod River and Mount Shasta and working to get Shasta Dam removed um, before it, is increased in size, that dam is one of the proposals to flood more of their sacred sites and villages. So um, they have uh, annual um, events to raise awareness about um, the Winnemumwintu River and its relationship to the whole Sacramento River down to the San Francisco Bay with their run for salmon. Thank you. Well, uh, Dar, what do you think? Should we go to some Q and A? Um, yeah, I think we just have time for uh, one or two questions, and then and, and then have uh, leave folks time each each of you three time to have some closing thoughts. And uh, the first question, I'll, I'll just put it out there, and whoever feels like answering it, please just jump in. Uh, and it's one that also came up in the book is talk about uh, rights versus obligations, kind of dominant culture's perception of, you know, everything's what are my rights uh, versus uh, the more indigenous perspective of uh, what are our obligations, if someone would like to speak to that. You know, I can say a few words about that. You know, one of the, the main jobs I have is a university professor and you know, often our universities are are pretty hypocritical. They they put out a certain political image, but internally people are in pain, and there's a lot of abuse that occurs within universities. And I've been at two universities that had extremely uh, problematic and abusive uh, records of relationships across students and faculty and and staff. And when they went to fix fix these issues, they found that people had all sorts of rights, uh, all sorts of contracts. There was all sorts of formal recognition of their rights as employees or students. Uh, but the breakdown in relationships had to do with the fact that on an everyday basis, uh, people didn't know how to treat each other and people were prone to exploiting each other. And I was very surprised when I started working on the solutions to these issues that the minute people started talking about how to change those aspects of relationality, those aspects that weren't codified in somebody's employment contract or that weren't uh, legal uh, principles uh, or that weren't institutionalized in terms of uh, different codes, that they didn't know what that meant. Like they didn't know how you create a culture of consent. They didn't know how you create a culture of trust. Like they literally had no idea, people with PhDs, people that had worked in institutions for the same institution for many years, had no idea about what it meant to cultivate an institution where people just treated each other well, they empowered each, each other, they made each other feel good and confident, they encouraged each other, and they made sure that everybody was safe. And I think that's one, just one angle into this idea about 
why on the one hand it is critical to have rights uh, and rights are, are extremely important, but in a society that only privileges rights as the primary means by which we relate to each other is one that's ignoring all the other different ways. And so I see indigenous approaches as, as, as emphasizing rights, but emphasizing also responsibilities and informal relationships that we have with each other, kinship relationships. And Melissa or Shannon, would you like to speak to that? I could uh, follow just briefly and then Shannon would love to hear your words. Um, yeah, I mean, Kyle said it so well. And I think that, you know, the proof is in the pudding a little bit, at least for me and most of the people I know, it's like when you solely focus on your individual rights, it's just like, an, it's that acquisitiveness, it's that self-centeredness. It's like, I got mine but it's so exclusive and kind of lonely. <laughs> it's, it's like not very satisfying, but when we have responsibilities and obligations, we know that we are more than our little humanness. We are part of something that's larger than ourself. And when we can give to, you know, children or elders or someone in need or someone who, you know, wants to give something to us, we can receive something in that spirit of reciprocity. It's not just giving, it's receiving. That's the, that's the cycle of, of obligation and kinship. And then we feel, I feel more whole. And, and it seems that indigenous peoples feel that, right? Like when we just have individual success, it's kind of lonesome. It just feels kind of awkward. Um, but when we have community success and community well-being, there's, there's just like this electric you know, quality. It's hard to, hard to put words to, but it, you can feel it. It's tangible. And, and so I would just say that experiment, right? Experiment with giving something, you know, and, and many of our elders say, when you really want something, when you really feel like you want something for yourself, we give it, right? We give it. And then it's it, all of a sudden, I, I don't need it anymore because I've been able to give it and that person has been able to receive it. My larger self has been able to receive it. So um, that's just for me, some of the kind of, you know, psycho-spiritual dimensions of the difference between rights and responsibilities and obligations. We know we're part of something greater than ourselves when we're responsible. Dar, you want me to, to try to answer that massive question? <laughs> Please, Shannon, and thank you, Melissa. In one minute. Um, so one of the things that I talk about to the men in the prison is rights and obligations, right? So for them, they're always like the legal system they screwed me up and, uh, I'm in prison here. You know, everybody in prison is innocent, right? So, uh, and I tease the men, I give them a hard time, but, but more importantly for me is that I tell them that they are obligated. They are obligated to learn these songs, these ceremonies, so that when I die, that it can be passed on. And going back to Melissa's point is that individual success is something we learn from a Western concept, that it is so embedded in us. Go to school, get a job, be, you know, buy a house, whatever. It's this Western idea of being, of being successful. But we don't look at community success and, and, and healing. What does it look like? I mean, I go back home and even though I do all these great things, um, I love to just go back home, sit with the kids and, and they are my healing. They are my, um, I get rejuvenated uh, when I come back to LA, when I, when I go to the community. Uh, I would rather cruise around on the res with, you know, 20 Indian kids sitting in the back seat listening to some pop music or something that I makes me want to throw up, but um, but that's my healing, right? That's I want them to see that Uncle Grandpa Shannon is not this far off figure. He is a community member and he loves us and he cares for us and he wants us 
to be healthy, successful, but he wants us to be culturally and spiritually rooted who we, and uh, as who we are as Akamir to Oatham. But so that is my obligation. So what is our obligation today? Do, we had a great talk. We have some great speakers and we have a, a wonderful book. But what is our obligation? Our obligation is to take and to learn and to implant it in other people so that we become this community successful success in healing that 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 sometimes i worry i worry about america right america is so rooted in this individualism that we're killing the rest of the planet and and uh, our ideas are so out of line that that uh, the only obligation is to self and it's not to the community so that's my thought so um so Thanks, Dar. Thanks, uh, Melissa and Kyle. Thank you, guys. Thanks very much, Shannon. And we are coming up on an hour and a half, and I wanted to make sure I left enough time for each of you to have uh, a few moments for any closing thoughts or uh, anything else you'd like to mention that hasn't come up tonight or reiterate anything. Uh, so unfortunately, we don't have time to get to a few questions that came in on chat in order to leave that time. So uh melissa uh if we, we just would you uh feel like starting off with well again i i'm sorry i missed what was said at the beginning but i think one of the overarching messages of this book which is an overarching message of so many i think indigenous leaders today is to uh reenact the art of listening and um, for so long, um, you know, we, we listen through a very particular lens. It's an individualistic lens. And to really open ourselves up and our senses, our mind, heart, body, spirit, to really listening to our fellow humans and listen to the plants and listen to the animals and listen to the climate. Like what is, what is mother earth trying to say to us right now? She is speaking pretty darn loudly. <laughs> she is, she is shouting at us. Right. And, um, you know, native people heard her whispers decades ago, maybe centuries ago, and were warning, you know, these early warnings were here. And now she's she's shouting and um, Native people and, and other sensitive people were trying to listen um, and, and do the right thing. So I would just emphasize the role of deep listening. Miigwech. Thank you so much, Melissa. Perfect. Uh, Kyle, please. Don't underestimate the power of your memory <laughs> and all the different things that that memory does just listening to the tremendous uh, words and experiences that uh, that Shannon shared that Melissa shared got my memory going more than one type of memory <laughs> um, so if, if you think there's just two types of memory or uh, maybe even one type uh, <laughs> There's like a hundred types <laughs> and uh, uh, memory is great, not just for the facts, uh, but also for the gaps, <laughs> for the, the things that you were, were unlearned, <laughs> for the things that uh, were not listened to, uh, but, but also for the, the lessons uh, uh, and just all the other things that make it possible that memory might be the most powerful tool for thinking about the future. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, uh, Melissa, Dar, uh, and all the Stan, my buddy Stan, Kyle. Uh, it's good to hear from you guys. I'll just share a quick story about my old grandpa. This was in the 1980s. He was probably 98 at the time. And uh, I went out in the back and he was sitting out there and I used to wonder why he would just stare out into the desert. And my mom said, uh, uh, so I would go out there and just wonder what he was doing. And he would be sitting there looking out. And I had asked, one time I asked him a question and he sat there for about 10 minutes. And he said, uh, and I said, grandpa, I kind of talked, spoke up. I said, did you hear me? And he said, yeah, be quiet, I'm listening. And he wasn't listening to me. 
per se. He was listening to the spirits getting ready to tell him what to answer or how to speak. And I was really, I was young, I was 18 or whatever. And I was running rugged. I was, I was a little res kid, just causing trouble, drinking, doing whatever I do, right? But that moment, my grandfather told me he was listening. He said, I, he said in autumn, I'm not listening to you. He said, I'm listening to what I should say and how I should respond. And I asked him this profound question about why did we live in such a dry place? Of course, that was before I knew anything about the damming of the Gila River. I mean, I knew the stories, but, but, but going back to Melissa's point, it's just listening. My grandfather had memory of what it looked like. And he had this DNA, this ancestral memory. And he was telling me something that I couldn't understand at that moment. But later in my life, I, I now understand that I have to listen and that we all have to listen, that we all have to sit back and say, what is my obligation to Mother Earth and to the future children? So thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Shannon. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Stan. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here tonight. And uh, uh, um, I, it's just really, really grateful to, to hear all three of you again, uh, just like we did during the book and have everybody together. And thanks so much, Peter and City Lights for hosting this event. It's, it's been a really, really good one.